In this short video I want to cover an issue that receives a much more thorough treatment by Dr. Bo Branson in his dissertation on the logical problem of the Trinity. This is the question of what the term God signifies, and the short answer is that it can signify different things. This answer might be surprising, especially to proponents of absolute divine simplicity, but it has much to do with the patristic understanding that the divine nature or essence is nameless and beyond comprehension. The longer answer to this question of what the name God signifies is that, in St. Gregory of Nyssa's view, outside of a specifically Christian context, it signifies the activity, power or energy of providentially sustaining the world, or in the etymology St. Gregory gives, overseeing the cosmos. This is the conventional sense he gives to the term divinity, theotes, too. Thus, in his arguments against Jews and Hellenists, at the beginning of his catechetical discourse, St. Gregory makes the logical case that this providential power sustaining all things in unity and multiplicity must proceed from a source that is both one, contrary to the belief of the Greeks, and many, contrary to the belief of the Jews. He uses these two false ideas to combat one another and shows that in their limitations they are surpassed by the Christian revelation of the Trinity. As he writes, Thus, when the dialogue is with a Hellenist, it would be good to make this the beginning of the argument. Whether he supposes the divine to exist, or if he agrees with the atheist's teaching. Thus, if he should say the divine does not exist, from the skillful and wise economy of the world, he will be led to admit the existence in them of some power displayed by them and transcending all. But if he should not doubt the divine's existence, but should be carried off into conjectures of a multitude of gods, let us use against him an order of argument such as this. Whether he regards the divine as perfect or deficient, and if, as is likely, he bears witness to the perfection of the divine nature, we will require him to grant perfection throughout all that is contemplated in the divinity, so that the divine might not be contemplated as a commixture of opposites, of deficiency and perfection. But whether with regard to power or with regard to the concept of the good, or with regard to wisdom, and incorruptibility and eternality or any other God-befitting thought that he might happen to cling to in his contemplation, he will affirm in every point the perfection that is to be contemplated regarding the divine nature, according to the reasonableness of the order of this argument. And if this is granted to us, it should no longer be difficult to bring round his thought, which is scattered among a multitude of gods, to the admission of one divinity. For if he should grant perfection to be admitted in every respect about the subject, and should say many perfect divinities exist, having the same characteristics, it is altogether necessary either, in the case of things distinguished by not even one variation, but which are contemplated with the same attributes, to display particularity, or, if thought should grasp nothing particularizing in things for which there is no distinction, not to conjecture the distinction. For if he should not discover a difference with respect to the greater and the deficient, since the principle of perfection does not admit deficiency, nor with respect to the worse and the more valuable, for one would no longer bear the supposition of divinity whose designation does not exclude the worse, nor with regard to the ancient and the brand new, for that which does not always exist is outside a proper supposition about the divine. But rather, he should discover that the principle itself of divinity is one, not one particularity being found in a single thing. As is reasonable, then, it is altogether necessary for the erring fantasy about a multitude of gods to be pressed to the admission of one divinity. To summarise, St. Gregory indicates that anyone to come to knowledge that there is such an activity or power, which men call God, but that doesn't tell us anything about the divine nature, nor does it reveal the personal reality of the Trinity. Indeed, since the divine nature is en hypostatic, that is, since it exists only in the three persons, it could not be revealed in any way except by the revelation of these persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. St. Gregory then goes on to illustrate with the scriptures the way in which the Trinity has been revealed to us. As I have covered in a previous video, it is the hypostases which particularize or individuate the divine nature via their mode of existence. That is, the Father is autotheos, the unbegotten, the Son is begotten by the Father before all ages, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father. These distinguishing marks reveal the distinctness of the persons, 
who are consubstantial and one God.